Hello and welcome back to The Stronghold. I'm the Magi and you know what time it is and we're going to get our midweek magic on. This week's midweek magic is another one of those pre-constructed showcases uh, again for alchemy in which they're going to be giving us five decks to choose from and battle it out for two free, rare, or better ICRs. So this week we're going to be talking about not only what to expect and how to prepare for this event, but we're also going to be talking about the multiple player types that you're going to find in Magic and more specifically on Arena, as well as a retool of the last Into the Future event bringing some of those decks into, well, a little more favorable position for play, uh, either on the play queue or in rank. But before we get into all that, allow me to do the awkward thing and promote the channel. A while back, one of my viewers was kind enough to point out that we are the only channel putting out timely midweek magic content. So be sure to subscribe right here at the Planeswalker Stronghold for all of your future midweek magic needs because we will be bringing you a deck list or strategy every single week. So what do you say we put all this aside and just get to that? We are going to be starting off our conversation today with the three major player archetypes. And of course, we have to start with Spike. Because after all, Arena is more or less built for the Spike player archetype. I mean, for heaven's sakes, they have their own ranked play queue. And even in the most casual formats of Brawl and Historic Brawl, you're still going to find plenty of spikes. But um, hey, guys, I, I think maybe we have the wrong slide up. Can we check that real quick? Ah, yes, uh, that's, that's much better. So uh, spikes tend to be, as we said, the most competitive style of players. Uh, these are the ones that are out there uh, in the meta, uh, whether they are net decking meta decks that other people developed, whether they uh, see themselves more as innovators, uh, whether they are part of a team or an individual player that's all about tuning a deck concept and getting it absolutely perfect for whatever situation the meta is presenting. Um, I find myself in this category a little bit as an analyst, uh, looking at uh, not only win ratios, uh, but how cards are performing in individual metas uh, to help tune those uh, types of decks. Um, or sometimes you see uh, what is referred to as a nuts and bolts type spike uh, that focuses their energies in perfecting their own gameplay and ironing out their play mistakes. Because let's face it, no matter how long we've been playing, we all occasionally make play errors. And uh, well, that's part of the game too. And next up, we've got the Timmies, or the Tammies, for the more female-oriented out there. Um, Timmies want to experience things, and uh, they get uh, a high of sorts off the feelings associated with playing the game. Uh, most often, I think when people think of Timmies, they think of the Power Gamer variant that's all about playing big splashy creatures or big splashy spells. Uh, but on the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, the griefer subset is about, well, how do I say this? Uh, making sure that the other player is kind of miserable. Things uh, like discard or uh, removal.deck. Um, on a more even keeled idea, you have the social gamer Timmies. Uh, these very often are more interested in playing with their friends. They uh, tend to gravitate towards multiplayer variants. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see these players doing uh, what's called group hug decks in multiplayer variants, uh, where they're not anybody's enemy, they're everybody's friend. And uh, it's more about having a good time and playing the game than whether you win or not. Uh, diversity or exploration gamers are a lot of times looking at multiple types of formats uh, because 
uh, exploration and growth as a player is really what it's about for them. And then, of course, you have the adrenaline subsets. Uh, they are more focused on the variants associated with the games. Um, a lot of times you hear these folks as uh, being anti-net deck. Uh, they're very much about brewing their own decks. Uh, they want decks that don't necessarily have the same consistent play lines every time. Uh, coin flips, chaos decks, uh, this is where those adrenaline gamers come in there. And uh, frankly, I can see some aspects of this in me. And really, that's the truth, is all of us are a little bit of all of these play types. And it's about understanding your balance and maybe where you are on an individual day. Because that can change for all of us. Uh, the Timmies out there tend to see the spikes as being way too hell-bent on winning and kind of missing the more fun aspects of the game. Whereas the spikes out there tend to view Timmies as uh, maybe newbies or inexperienced, whether it's true or not. And the last of the original big three is going to be the Johnnies or the Jennies out there, which are most typically archetyped as combo players. Uh, they're fascinated by card interactions, uh, combos, and they really want to do something original, uh, something a little off the beaten path. Again, they tend towards playing their own decks for their own reasons, and they see their decks as uh, an artistic form of self-expression. Uh, they build decks to do things that embody uh, a particular elf culture, or uh, oftentimes they want to do things that other people have considered undoable, or explore what-if territory. Um, these were the people who first invented things like the Goblin Charbelcher. Uh, can we build a deck without land? Uh, can we build decks without creatures? Uh, all enchantments, no enchantments. Uh, can we build a deck without instant interaction? Uh, all sorts of creative aspects. And generally, they're more interested in winning on their own terms rather than uh, winning overall. I've many times seen a stereotypical Johnny give up on a easy onboard win in an attempt to combo off in a more creative way. Uh, Johnny's will tend to see spikes as, uh, well, somewhat uptight or unoriginal, and oftentimes they see Timmy's as uh, simplistic or maybe even childish. Whereas the spikes of the world will very often see Johnny's as uh, eccentric, uh, maybe a little kooky, or in some cases even annoying. And, of course, the Timmies of the world very often will look at Johnny's as being way too focused on one style of play and missing out on a lot of fun and maybe they just need to relax a little bit or, or broaden their perspectives. So those first three player uh, psychographics, if you would, uh, have been around really since the beginning of the game, but weren't really formalized until uh, none other than Mark Rosewater did so uh, in an article back in 2002. And several years later, uh, other contributors uh, coined the phrase of the Borthos, a player that was more interested in the artistic side of magic and less so about the play aspects. Uh, these type of, uh, well, magic players, uh, in air quotes, if you would, uh, again, they tend to focus on the artistic side, whether that is the art on the cards, uh, written story of the game, the, uh, the flavor text that appears on cards, um, how the game expresses its itself in the real world through things like uh, cosplay and, and things of that sort. Um, they very often are interested in the universes beyond aspects that you see now. And uh, that is a clear example of how Wizards of the Coast has now started to uh, embrace this type of player uh, where it took many years for them to even really actively acknowledge them. Uh, and of course, you also have the 
dreamers that want to contribute to magic lore through things like fan art or, or writing their own fan fiction. We've come a long way, guys, and uh, I think it's a good thing. The Vorthos aficionados um, almost universally look at the other three player archetypes or uh, psychographics as uh, missing the bigger picture, whereas the big three tend to look at Vorthos as the the weird guy who hangs out in the corner of the LGS and is constantly making weird decks, but never really seems to play. And uh, well, I have to say that's been my experience for better or worse. All right, so now let's move on to Alchemy decks. Uh, just a couple weeks back, Wizards of the Coast hosted another midweek magic that featured, once again, five pre-constructed decks. But in classic Wizards of the Coast style, these decks were not very well balanced, even against each other, and their mana bases in particular left a lot to be desired. So because you matter, I reached out to the community and asked which of these decks would they most want to see rebuilt. The overwhelming response was the Dragons Take Flight, uh, Rakdos style Dragon Ramp deck. Um, one of the early uh, leaders on the survey was the Teamer Adventures deck, uh, but it kind of fell off in the competition a little bit later. And of course, everyone uh, kind of universally picked their number two choice as Powerful Pigs. Um, and well, I've got something for all three of these decks for you today. Uh, we'll start with the bad news, the Dragons Take Flight deck. And the bad news is this Rakdos Dragons deck is, well, in my opinion, unsavable as far as any sort of budget deck, either for Standard or for Alchemy. Uh, the majority of the deck is higher rarity cards. Uh, I think from the original deck, not counting basic lands, it was only like a dozen lower rarity cards to be found, um, making 80% of the deck or so uh, rares and mythics and uh, that just doesn't give us a lot to work with. Uh, the other issue that we ran into here is the mana curve was really more of a cliff. Uh, you, you had uh, a, a pretty substantial uh, uh, high end curve here that uh, really didn't give the deck much opportunity to, to develop. Uh, it either got there on the high end or it didn't, and unfortunately, most of the time, it didn't get there. Um, so I don't think there is a way to save this for either Standard or Alchemy, but that doesn't mean there isn't hope. There is, however, a number of cards that allow us to build this deck to be a more even mana curve it, at the lower spectrum in particular and still maintain that very dragon tribal aspect that I think is what's resonating with most of its users. Uh, the first column here are all colorless changelings that uh, not only help a dragon's deck have something to do at the lower portions of the curve, but assist any tribal creature deck um, the Faceless Agent, I really think, is a three or four of in any deck like this for Historic. Uh, Universal Automation and B Bloodline Pretender are probably a one of, unless you really need one drops. Uh, Universal Automation is kind of unique in that aspect. And not every tribe has good one drops. Dragons, for instance. Uh, at the two drop slot, we've got a Dragon Hatchling. Uh, Dragon Lord Servant that makes all of your dragon spells later cheaper. What a cool, great way to use turn two. Uh, Fearsome Whelp is probably the best two drop dragon ever printed um, as it makes all the dragons in your hand cheaper. It's flying, it's haste, it's a 1 1. Great. And uh, Reckless Barbarian is a nice way to ramp up uh, by using two mana that might otherwise have gone to waste and carrying that forward into a future turn where you can drop, say, a really big nasty dragon. 
Um, at the three drop slot, we've got the Dragon Egg. Um, I don't really love this one, but it is a reasonable inclusion here. Uh, it does block pretty well, and then, of course, it leaves behind an even better and more aggressive potential threat. Uh, Swashbuckler Extraordinaire, uh, one of those triple type old creatures as a dragon, rogue, and warrior. When it ETBs, it creates a treasure token, um, which can be nice, uh, particularly in a deck like Dragons that's trying to ramp up into five, six, seven drop territory. Uh, additionally, whenever you attack, you can sacrifice one or more treasures. When you do up to that many creatures, gain double strike. So this can also be a very nice finisher when you have ramped up, uh, but maybe you're getting clogged in the combat zone for whatever reason. Um, Dragon Speaks Channeler is another creature that makes your dragon spells less expensive. So if you were to play your servant, and then a Shaman on three, untapping on four with four mana, you could cast a seven drop dragon on turn four uh, with no other assistance. And speaking of other assistance, of course, the adventure spell, Young Red Dragon is a three one flyer for four mana. So not bad stats. It's adventure, which is a two cast um, is creating a treasure token. So again, another way to ramp into those crucial later turns for your dragon deck. Uh, the fourth column here is mostly dragon adjacent spells. Uh, Dragon's Fire, of course, is the direct damage of choice. Uh, the Orb of Dragonkind, uh, Carnelian, is, uh, well, a nice way to ramp. There are other colors of this as well. All of them produce a mana of any color. So this allows you to splash in dragons of a non-red nature without necessarily polluting your mana base. And again, it's ramping. Uh, Breath Weapon is a nice way to sweep the board of anything that dares not be a dragon. And um, this is probably a two or three of in a deck like this just to keep, getting, keep from getting overrun by tokens or elves or something like that. Uh, Dragon's Approach is probably a build-around card and not a typical Dragon Tribal deck, but uh, certainly worth considering and uh, can be particularly interesting in something like Brawl. Uh, the last column here, of course, are lands that make tribal slash creature decks a little more accessible. Ancient Ziggurat, uh, mana of any color, but only for creatures. And then uh, Secluded Courtyard and uh, Unclaimed Territory, of course, we have talked about those before, uh, are typal or tribal creature lands. Uh, they are only going to produce mana to cast spells of a chosen creature type. And then Temple of the Dragon Queen is uh, allows you to produce a chosen color to uh, cast dragon spells. Uh, very good stuff. Again, allows you with all of these to splash in particular dragons without the need to pollute your mana base. So hopefully that gives you a lot of ideas of what directions you could take this for as a historic build. And if you want to see my full build out version on that, uh, just use uh, dragons to start your comment down below. And if there's enough interest in it, we'll do a full video bump out on that type of deck for you uh, to reach out to our historic players. My budget version of this deck, uh, I think it ticks most of the boxes that we were looking for. I think it uh, better respects your use of wild cards for the signature cards like Three Little Pigs, uh, Swine Rebellion, Porcine Porton, and finds room to include the Drover of Swine. Uh, the mana base, we tried to go with a lot less punishing 
tempo uh, issues and all of that, uh, making good use of the cards that you do already own or probably should already own. And of course, we finished out the deck by splashing in some potential budget powerhouses from the new player experience. Cards uh, like Nisa Resurgent Animist, Galissa Sunslayer, Conduit of Worlds, Breach the Multiverse, and Gix's Command all add and contribute to the game plan here uh, as opposed to just splashing in cards for no particular reason. I really like this deck and uh, if you're interested in this kind of build or looking to invest some wild cards in a, well, in my opinion, pretty fun alchemy deck to run, uh, highly recommend checking out the list through the link down in the doobly-doo. Uh, there is also a historic combo version of the deck that can be built. Uh, I haven't uh, really tested it yet, but if you're interested in seeing my version on that, uh, definitely start your comment down below with uh, the word pigs and uh, if there's enough interest we will put that out there as well and of course if you are interested in both that deck and the historic build of the dragons deck you can start with both those words uh, and we'll get both of those out there for you because hey i'm here for you on the other end of things, the Powerful Pigs deck that was uh, featured and was our ultimate number two pick in the survey gave us a lot more to work with. Um, I didn't feel like the deck was, well, particularly well constructed. Uh, a lot of the numbers and quantities just seemed a little arbitrary, uh, like running three copies of each of the three little pigs uh, without any regard for what they actually did. Uh, two copies of Porcine Portent uh, on the other end, that is way too important of a card uh, to just run two copies. The uh, exclusion of the Mythic card that was obviously designed for this archetype seemed like a huge miss, and the mana base was, well, clunky at best. And uh, many of these decks are guilty of running entirely too many tap lands and, and falling over to its own tempo issues. Uh, the three color deck like this in particular was really guilty of that. But there was still some things here for us to work with and I think we came up with a successful alternative. And lastly, let's talk about Adventure into Eldraine, the final selection from you all, the community out there. Uh, I love the idea of a Teamer Adventures deck and the last time we visited Eldraine a few years back, this was an extremely powerful standard deck and I'm sure with some of the additions that they made here would have been equally powerful in Alchemy had such a format existed then. Uh, but to be honest, between the tempo punishing land base for this deck, uh, some of the card choices that just didn't make sense, and really what felt like a desire to just splash in cards without respect for a player's wild cards, I really found it difficult to work with this deck. Uh, I never did find a consistent build that worked for either Standard or Alchemy. Um, if you were able to find a list on that, by all means, please feel free to send that to me and uh, perhaps I'll be able to feature that and of course give you as the player uh, contributor uh, credit for that list. Uh, but all that having been said, I was able to find a nice list that I'm able to suggest to you. It's just not for alchemy. It, of course, is a brawl list, and uh, that means it's not featuring some of the new um, alchemy additions to the archetype, but it has a much less tempo-punishing mana base and makes much better use of your wild cards. 
uh, not only because you only need one copy for Brawl, but uh, because you only need one copy, you probably already have most of these cards in your collection. And I think a lot of people following the plan are going to be able to build this deck with probably less than five to ten higher rarity cards, depending upon how much you've already invested in Brawl style decks. And of course, all of our Brawl decks for the year, the very best, uh, most competitive ones, as well as the most popular ones, will be upgraded to historic Brawl decks at the end of the year. So if you like this concept and you like the list that I'm presenting, be sure to tap the like button over on the Ether Hub list so I know you're digging it and want to see more. And now let's talk about what to expect from this week's Midweek Magic event more specifically. When we take a look at the meta results for October uh, since the release, we see that this uh, new release, as well as the rebalancing of the One Ring and the Orcish Bowmaster, have had, well, less effect than I think a lot of people were hoping for. Uh, not only is Mono Red still the undisputed King of the Hill, uh, with a very similar deck to our own Phyrexian Tribal, bringing up the second most played deck, uh, Orcish Bowmaster is still in the top 10. Um, we see no other Wilds of Eldraine's decks uh, really out there as any fervent archetype other than the Rakdos Rats deck, and well, that's towards the bottom of the list, although it is sporting a 64% win rate. Um, so by all means, look into that deck. I don't know if we'll see it tonight, but it is certainly something to consider for your own alchemy and standard needs. All right, so this time around, the fine folks over at Wizards have done something a little bit different, and they have actually given us the preview information uh, the day before the event is going to start. So let's take a few minutes and talk about these. Uh, we've got uh, five decks in total, and my initial response to this is three out of these five decks look very much like the starter decks. And that can be a good thing because you may already know very well how to pilot those particular decks. Uh, being the Boris Equipment, the Mono White Soldiers, and the Golgari Midrange. On the flip side of that coin, though, you might already be tired or frustrated with some of these builds. Uh, let's dive in a little bit deeper. For the Boris Equipment, uh, the first thing that I notice here is I don't think they have yet solved the creature to equipment ratio that plagues a lot of these decks. Uh, the other thing that I notice uh, more or less right off is that for an aggro deck, all of its cards are centered on the three drop slot. And this seems like it's something that Magic in general is, uh, is kind of suffering from at the moment. Like your game begins at turn three. Uh, the good news with that style of build though is the tap lands are really going to be a plague. I, I guess that's not good news. Um, so on the times where you do have something that you want to play on one or you want to play on two, uh, or your third land comes down tapped, uh, a wind scarred crag is, is really a problem. And uh, I hope this is something that they're going to address with some of the new uh, uncommons that are coming with the shifts and the play boosters and all of that stuff. Um, but we'll have to see how much of that is uh, speculation and how much becomes reality. Uh, Azorius Control, I think, is a really solid, good-looking deck. Uh, the mana base is really not too bad. I mean, You've got um, uh, a fast land, you've got a pain land, you've got two copies of Myrix, and the rest of your cards are, are just basic uh, plains and islands. 
So the deck that might could best survive the tempo lands and, and kind of push through it is the deck that doesn't seem to have any. Uh, you've also got uh, two Captivating Crossroads in there. You've got two copies of the One Ring and uh, Reprieve. So uh, the, the cards from Alchemy that are in here, or more specifically from Lord of the Rings, because uh, I don't think this deck features a single card for Alchemy that is not Lord of the Rings. Um, but they will have an opportunity to shine and perform really, really well. Uh, Reprieve is a great control piece, as is the One Ring. Uh, now, in taking a look at Mono White Soldiers, of course, uh, you've got probably the best mana base out here, although I don't know that you need 24 planes in this. But then again, they are running things like Leona War Leader and Rescue Retriever. So maybe the mana does need to be that high. Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, we mostly have cards that look like combinations of the starter decks here. In fact, it's it's really kind of a blend of the Soldiers and the Cleric's Life Gain deck. And sadly, it's not really doing either one particularly efficiently, uh, although I do think that this deck will probably spark some creativity in a lot of players that maybe aren't used to running either of those decks. Uh, Golgari Midrange, again, looks very much like the, uh, the starter deck. It has two full play sets of the common tempo lands. Um, no rares in the mana base other than four copies of the Alchemy Signature card, Captivating Crossroads. And I'm not sure that's the right choice here. I mean, as a mid-range, it's, it's going to be a little less susceptible to tempo lands, but uh, we saw a similar build last time. Alchemy did one of these pre-constructed events, and it really suffered from the tempo lands, and I think we're going to see the same thing here. Um, if you get good hands, uh, good draws, good land base, particularly your first three or four turns, I think this deck will do very well but it's going to be very dependent on that, and uh, I think you're going to have to make some very insightful mulligan decisions here. And uh, the last, and uh, what I think looks to be the most interesting, is uh, they have brought back our boy Joda. Um, four copies of Joda, uh, 28 all legendary creatures, uh, with the exception of Delighted Halfling. Um, you've got probably the best mana base out of all of these decks. Although uh, Argoth and, um, what is it, Thornwood Falls both feel a little off there. I'm not sure those were optimal choices. Uh, you've got another four copies of Captivating Crossroads. Uh, I'm not sure four is the best call, but I mean, hey, let's play around with it and, uh, and see what we can do with it. Um, the alchemy cards in this deck, mostly uh, Aragon and Boromir, really have good opportunities to shine in this deck. And uh, I think this looks like a fun deck. Um, now, how good it will actually play will be another thing. Uh, you don't really see any ramp in this, uh, which is a little scary, but uh, all in all, it does look fun. Fun. Um, I'm not sure about uh, DNH here, uh, particularly being two copies. That feels like a very restrictive uh, mana cost. But uh, I don't know, with things like Delightful Halfling, maybe it's not so bad. I, of course, will be jumping into the vent as soon as I'm able to do so and posting my own thoughts and results within the description and comments. And, of course, I encourage other members of the community to share their own thoughts and experiences with this event and the presented deck list because, at the end of the day, we're all budget players and we're stronger together. And hey, just in case you didn't catch all that, Matt would like you to know that the deck list that we discussed in this video is going to have a link down in the doobly-doo to take you over to Etherhub, uh, along with a link to any other alternative list that you might wish to consider. He only asked that you 
give it a little like thumbs up when you're over there checking out the deck list. And I plan on live playing this event on Wednesday at 11 a.m. over on my Twitch channel. So definitely stop in and check it out. Because The Stronghold is so much more than just a YouTube channel and you can find links to all of our other social media outlets in our profile. Because at the end of the day, we're all budget players. And as a community, we're stronger together. So like, comment, subscribe, follow, do all those things to show a little love. It's appreciated more than you know.